Hey YouTube, it's JP Dillon. Welcome to part two of the 12 inch Admiral Color TV. Today we're going to see if we can get the chassis out and do some reconnaissance as to what capacitors are going to be needed in the way of electrolytics and see what any other things come up uh, that are of necessity to address on this set. So I've got the back off and more or less what we need to do is get the chassis out which is probably going to require that we disconnect the CRT uh, and anything else here that's in our way. The tuner assembly looks like it's going to need to come out. There's four quarter inch nuts there. Uh, that shouldn't be too big of a deal. So really let's just start unplugging things and see if we can get this thing loose. And Let's see, red, black, and gray. These are actually labeled on the board, which is good. So I don't have to worry about where those go later on. And I'm trying to look around to see perhaps if there's a plug-in for the yoke. But it doesn't look like there is, so this, this could be fun. I'm trying to get this yoke off the CRT here. So let's get a quarter-inch nut driver. And let's pop the screws loose for the chassis first. And we can see we got one here. I've already taken the knobs off the front. And that definitely pops the chassis loose. So now we're going to check and see what kind of freedom of movement we have. I see that there's another screw up here. This is going to be really fun to put all this back together and converge it all. I'm going to dust off the uh, neck of the CRT here. And then I'm going to mark the position of the lateral magnet and the purity rings. Because my assumption is, is all this will have to come off. Loosen that. Oh, that whole shebang comes off. That's kind of nice. That whole self-contained convergence assembly there, that's pretty cool. All right, and I have the high voltage lead there I need to discharge, but that's pretty easy. Let's see, there's usually discharge anode to metal chassis, which is listed there. Let me get a clip. Always follow the directions. So if they don't want you to do it to the DAG, don't do it to the DAG, do it to the chassis. So we're going to slip this underneath here. It's probably discharged by now. Just hold that there. It's been about a week since it's been off, so I'm not too worried about it. And then let's see here. There should be a clip to push on. Yep. And then we can work this out. Assuming it wants to come out. This one sure is fighting me. Okay, we got freedom of movement there. Let's see. Yep, the yoke's definitely going to have to come off. So let's go ahead and loosen this. And once again, I'm going to make a little discerning mark to 
tell me where the yolk's at right now to make purity and uh, adjustments easier. We'll loosen this. And pull this out just like that. And I'm just going to let that pull a little bit of slack on that a little more and just let this rest here. We'll disconnect our speaker, which thankfully just unplugs like this. And then we'll do the four quarter inch nuts that hold the tuner assembly in. This is really going to be the only practical way to service this because there's no access from the bottom panel. Oh, I just fell. I'm not too concerned about that. This one's pretty tricky to get at. to get out. Okay. We'll do the last one here, noting that there's a ground strap up there. And I've got to support the tuner while I take this loose so it doesn't fall and hurt anything. So oh well, a little screw falls, I don't care. Alright, so there's the tuner, which I'm going to carefully set down here. And then lastly, it's hard to see because of all the stuff in the way. Oh, we got another ground strap there. We got one over here, and we got the control panel up here. First I'm going to see about the right hand side ground strap. That just goes to a point on the chassis here with this quarter inch. So I'm just going to release that. And let's see if I can swing it out so you guys can see the uh, control panel. I gotta take loose. I love the accumulation of filth in here. This is really, really something else. It's got nicotine glaze and crust of many years. But I'm not about cleaning the cabinet right now. Alright, so the control panel is out. So the entire chassis, let me lift out of the way here so I can get the cabinet clear. Alright, set this aside for a moment. And then I'll lift the cabinet out of the way. Actually, for easy storage, I'm going to put the back on the cabinet because I'm not going to need to get to the cabinet for a while. Thankfully, this doesn't rely on the chassis to hold the back on.
Okay, so the cabinet's back together for now. So you can see there that all that's left is just the shell, which is fine. I just want to make sure that something stupid isn't going to happen with the back off the set, like something falls on the CRT and kills the project. Been there, done that. So let me take this away. It is much lighter without the chassis in it. CRT in the plastic cabinet maybe weighs maybe 20 pounds at best. With the chassis in there, it's substantially heavier. And let me just finish bagging up these screws. Bear with me. All right. Let's bring the chassis back. Mess that it is. Okay. Yeah, they hardwire the yoke in here, which I'm not really thrilled about. But it is what it is. So this kind of gives us a better view of the chassis as a whole. And I think what I may do is that screw roaming around in there somewhere. This gives you a much better view. So over here we've got our color. There's your IF over here, your AGC adjust, blah, blah, blah. I think that's your audio output trans, uh, transistor right there. And then this is your color demodulation. Over here is your sweep. Let's turn it around so we can take a look at the bottom side that we couldn't see while it was in the cabinet. That's assuming that I can manipulate all of this easily enough. I think that's going to be our biggest difficulty, is trying to service this thing with all the stuff attached to it, which I'm not thrilled about. Okay, so... Better, I'm trying to figure out a better way to shut the light on this so you can see it. Uh, okay. Let's just do the spotlight. Now you can see the soldering on the low voltage side is just fine. I don't see any bad solders at first glance. Everything on this up here looks fine. This is your low voltage section. But when you come down here to where all the tubes are, you can definitely see that there needs to be soldering and stuff. And this may have been stuff that I did years ago, and I just don't remember, but I don't remember doing any soldering work on this. And it definitely is not my work. It's very sloppy. Okay, so we were hearing a hum in the audio that kept getting progressively louder. So we've got some electrolytics here. We've got a multi-section can up there. We've got part of a doubler here, that's a, one of the doubler capacitors, and then we have another one over here. And then top side, you've got this here, which looks like a main filter for this low voltage board here. And then you've got lots of little electrolytics, like these little stand-up guys. They're probably all bad. Here's another one over here. Those are all going to get replaced. And then we got to check our tin control, which is probably bad. So out of curiosity, let me get the ESR meter, and we'll check our main filters. But I think even if they show okay on the ESR meter, I'm going to replace them because, you know, hum. 
see if I can angle this a little bit better so you can see it. Okay, so first, let's do our brief check here. Yep, all right. Let's go to this one. That one checks okay. That one checks okay. Let's go over here. Section of that is open. It is absolutely open. Not even kind of sorta. It is open. That kind of registers. Come on. Oh, stupid me. Doubler. Doubler's isolated from the chassis. Still not great though. Dirty connection. All right. And then we'll go back to the chassis mounted ones. That section's open. That section's, that's kind of there. Not great. That's open. That's hanging on there. There must be a lot of oxidation on these leads. That doesn't test great. Yeah, just, I don't know, not great. I'm going to change them anyways, just because they're not great. Yeah, let's just take a couple of samplings of these tiny guys. There's a capacitor underneath here for your low voltage. There we go. That still checks okay. But the fact that I was hearing hum in the sound really makes me believe that although they may have good ESR, the overall value of them has probably gone away. And there's the low voltage transformer I was looking for. This feeds the... the uh, 24 volt stuff. It's usually 12 or 24 volts, probably 24 volt on this set. So, and then let's just uh, sample a few things here. Try to find a capacitor to measure just out of sheer curiosity. Electrolytic there tests okay. Electrolytic there tests okay. And again, they can have good ESR, but still be leaky or bad. That little film guy doesn't test very well. Neither does that. So, this isn't really a good gauge of what kind of condition this is in. Uh, but the erratic readings and the caps and stuff like that, I'm just going to replace them anyways. We've got this giant dropping resistor with absolutely no identification on it whatsoever. I'm curious to see what it measures. Because these are the type of resistors that love to go high or open. So let's see if it's a, a relatively normal value. 84 ohms, so it's probably supposed to be 82. This big 1.5 bleeder. That's supposed to be 1.5K, it says. Why is it measuring 32K? So, something to look at there. And that's, uh, let's see here. Then we have a cathode resistor, 100 ohms. It's measuring 116, 15% difference. Those are usually. Silver, what is that? 10%? 20%? I think silver's 10%. So it's a little off. And then it's 2.7 ohm. Come on. Get a grip. 2.9. So for the most part, 
it is weird here how I've got this 1.5k resistor to ground that is measuring make sure I got it in the right spot I guess let's pull this back it measures 1.3 ohms so <clears throat> none of that adds up to me anyways I'm just rambling at this point so what we need to do is figure out what capacitors we need to replace the main filters make a list of electrolytics on the low voltage side that need to be changed out for color video and etc and uh, then check out that tin control uh, and see what we need to get for that all right, so looking at our main filters, there's a doubler there, the 200 volt, 350 microfarad. And then we have another 200 at 350. This is the other part of your doubler here. And then you have a 160 at 350, and an 80 at 200, and a 10 at 350. So I can make up all that stuff. That's, you know, 220 at I probably have a 400 or 450 volt cap, stuff like that. That's easy. And then coming over here to this other can here, this is obviously the low voltage stuff. You got 2,000 microfarad times two, 40 volts each, no biggie. And then over here, let's see what this guy is. Make everybody dizzy. Looks like a 50 microfarad at 150 volts. Whoop de doo. And just look around the board here for any other electrolytics. I don't think there is. Little overheated section there. Trying to see what that transistor is. If that's a regulator or an audio output device, it's hard to tell. And then taking a look at our board here most engineers of this time love things like 22 microfarad or 10 microfarad I'm trying to see if I can see anything in here can't really tell there's a lot of garbage Something at 25 volts. Bendy, bendy. There we go. There's our 5 microfarad there. Probably going to see a lot of those. Yeah, the ESR on these was testing way too good for 5 microfarads. Come on, zoom out. So that's a 5. That's a film cap. Where are you? Can't read nothing. Eight microfarad. Ooh, stepping up. No one's oozing out the top. So yeah, there's like five microfarad, eight microfarad. Doesn't look like there's any weird any weird values here. Although eight is kind of weird, I'll just replace it with a ten. There's another one down in there, 10 microfarad, no, 100 microfarad, 10 volt. These are all decouplings and stuff like that, they all got to go bye-bye. That's pretty much that. There's not a whole lot to do, it's just a lot of tedious resoldering and part replacement. And then, of course, there's probably stuff hiding underneath here. But, I mean, the IF response was good. It's just a head weak video in crummy color. Now, let's see what that uh, tin control is supposed to be. Okay, so here's that tin control we were looking at earlier. The one that's either on or off. So let me uh, 
hit a meter on it really quick. I know the lighting here sucks, but it's what I got to work with. Let's see what kind of uh, linearity we have with this pot. Now, it looks like it's only doing it as a, using the wiper. It's not shunted. Okay, so we got 27K in one direction, and then all of a sudden 25K. So it's 28K, 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 up four megs. This pot's bad. And then we got one ohm. So what happens if we go to the other side of the wiper? Probably the same thing. Come on. All right, so we got 45. Come on. If I could only get the connections right. All right, so there's 5 ohms. Interesting. How I have linearity here from this terminal point. Uh, and then it goes cattywampus again. Two megs. 28k. One, yes, okay. All right, let's get some uh, contact cleaner in as a last resort. I doubt that it's going to really fix anything. I think the pot's just bad. Hell, I can't even see where the opening is for this. Let me get a flashlight from my phone. They got it wrapped up in some kind of like electrician's tape thing. Just work it a bit. Because this is kind of a unique control, it has a weird shaft, so I don't really think I'm going to be able to easily replace this. I mean, I can always make something work, but it's a question of how much effort. All right, so that so shows a short in that direction, a little more linearity, and then we drop off to open. Yep, we keep jumping around. This control is just bad. I might be able to stuff another carbon wafer in there, but I think it's more effort than I want to exert. And we have linearity here up until about midpoint. And then we jump around between 600 ohms and open is 12 megs. So, yeah, this that's just outright open there for 40 megs. You know, it's not going to the circuit circuit's not going to work there. So measuring the resistive element, 35K, and that's just all the time. So <clears throat> if I find some 50K or something like that to put in there, I'm sure that'll work. Oh boy. Yeah, the color worked normally and the volume worked normally, but this tint control here was just dead. And I need to find something with a relatively long shaft and to cut it down because the knobs are weird. And then as I recall also, oh, there's an electrolytic I missed there. 50 microfarad. It looks kind of cooked. As I recall the uh, brightness and contrast were kind of on or off too, but I'm not going to screw with them too much because the circuit actually still worked. So I might just leave that be. But uh, that's enough information that I think I can proceed on repairs. Uh, really, it's a matter of executing the installation of the capacitors, replacing the old electrolytics on the low voltage side of things. Replacing that tin control is going to be tricky. But that will get it. That's, that's enough information that I think I can proceed. So thanks for watching this segment. Uh, stay tuned for part three.